Good day. So for this session, we are to focus on the protozoans, particularly the amoeba. For the learning objectives at the end of this lesson, the students are expected to explain the difference between pathogenic and commensal amoebae, familiarize the life cycle associated with each amoebic parasite that includes route of transmission, infective stage, and diagnostic stages, and lastly, identify steps to stop and prevent amoeba infections. So to start with, what are protozoa? So protozoa are single-celled organisms, or they are considered as unicellular organisms. So they are like algae because algae are also unicellular. And these protozoa are the lowest form of animal life. And they are also animal-like protists. So when we say protists, they are diverse organisms. So these protozoa are eukaryotic. So protists are um, diverse eukaryotic organisms that are not animals, plants, or fungi. So we classify them as protists. And these protozoa have no cell wall, but they do have outer membrane, which is the periplast. And also, a cytoplasm containing the outer and inner region, which are the ectoplasm and endoplasm, respectively. And they are also provided with vacuoles. So, what is a vacuole? So, this vacuole is just basically a water bubble within the endoplasm. And the main function of this vacuole is to collect excretory waste, like, for example, ammonia. So, it will collect waste from the intracellular fluid by the process of diffusion and also active transport. And another one is they divide by fission, specifically binary fission. So fission means, or binary fission means, they split into parts. So it's like they divide in order to increase in numbers. And also, um, in this type of um, reproduction, the replication only occurs in the trophozoite stage. So, trophozoite. So, again, the replication only occurs in the trophozoite stage. And again, it is accomplished by multiplication of the nucleus via this binary fission. And they are also provided with locomotory organelles. So, this one includes cilia, flagella, and pseudopods. And this is very important because these loco uh, locomotory organelles um, classify the protozoans. So that means the protozoans are classified according to their organ of locomotion. So basically what that means is that the most important feature that separates amoeba from the other group of unicellular protozoa is the means by which they move or again their organ of locomotion such as this one. So the protozoans are classified as sarcodina, mastigophora, or flagellata, ciliophora or ciliata, and then sporozoa. So I know that by their name, you already have an idea of their locomotory organelles. So first for the sarcodina. So these are basically amoeba, and they are equipped with the ability to extend their cytoplasm. So that's in the form of pseudopods. So that is their organ of locomotion, and we call this as false feet. So false feet or pseudopods. So these are the pseudopods of amoeba. So their cytoplasm extends in order to form that locomotory organelle. Next one, for mastigophora or flagellata, you know that they have, of course, they have flagella. Also for ciliophora or ciliata, they have cilia. So it's like a hair-like projection. So these are the cilia and this one, this is a flagellum. And for sporozoa, they don't have definitive locomotory organelles. So just like your plasmodium that causes malaria. And I hope you still remember this one. So the endoparasites that we will be discussing for the entire session of parasitology. So for now, we are here in the protozoans. So that's the four classes of protozoan parasites. So the sarcodina or amoeba have basically two stages, the trophozoites and the cyst. So for the trophozoite, it's the one that is motile. So it has the pseudopodia or the false feet as their locomotory organelle. And for the cyst, it's non-motile. 
And for trophozoites, since its motile is the one that can feed and is considered as the feeding or vegetative stage. For cyst, it's non-feeding stage. And the trophozoites are commonly isolated from diarrheic or liquid or let's say watery stool samples. And for cyst, they are commonly found in well-formed stool. So that means when you already see a specimen submitted in the laboratory, so that means when you see it as something that is watery or diarrheic, you already have an idea in mind that probably what is inside of that stool sample is a trophozoite stage of amoeba. Whereas if you receive a formed stool specimen, most of the time, what is recovered from that is a cyst stage of amoeba. And another one, you should not use iodine if you want to recover trophozoid stages because this iodine will destroy the trophozoites because these trophozoites are delicate and fragile whereas your cyst contain thick cell walls. It's like a protective barrier of the cyst. And also this one is the infective stage, the cyst. And another one, we have these terms, encystation and existation. So when I say encyst, that means the trophozoite turns into a cyst. So encyst station, it becomes a cyst. But when we say existation, the cyst turns into trophozoites. That, that is inside of our gastrointestinal tract. Because you have to take note that existation, um, or I mean the amoeba, if it is excreted as trophozoites, can no longer mature into cyst. If it is already excreted, meaning to say out of the body. So it can no longer insist if it has been excreted out from our body. And also, this excitation occurs in the lower intestine. And in that area, the organisms begin to multiply as trophozoites. So again, trophozoite to cyst, that means in cyst or encystation. Cyst to trophozoite, that means exist or existation. And we have the following rules in order for us to remember the sarcodina. So first, all amoeba or all sarcodina are commensals. So when we say commensals, that means they don't cause disease. They are non-pathogenic. So all amoeba are non-pathogenic or don't cause disease except one sarcodina. And what is it? That is intamoeba histolytica because intamoeba histolytica is pathogenic. Another one, all amoeba inhabit the colon, the large intestine, except one. So that is intamoeba gingivalis. So I know it's easier to memorize because the name is gingivalis. So that means... It lives in the oral cavity. And lastly, all amoeba has cyst stage. All amoeba. But E. gingivalis doesn't have cyst stage. It only has trophozoites. So if you memorize these rules, then it will be easier for you to get acquainted with the other types of amoeba. So these are the seven species of amoebae which are commonly found in human fecal samples. So again, out of seven, this one is pathogenic or that is the one that causes disease. For the intestinal amoeba, we have three genera. So the entamoeba, endolimax, and aidamoeba. And take note that ehistolytica, again, this one, ehistolytica is the only amoebic species capable of invading tissues and causing disease. That's why it is a pathogenic type of amoeba. And the rest are commensals or non-pathogenic. And usually what is happening when an amoeba enters our body is that the cyst that we ingest, so remember in the previous slide, the cysts are considered as the infective stage. So this is what we normally acquire. If we are uh, exposed to people who have parasites or if we are exposed to contaminated food or water, so we will acquire the cyst. So this cyst now will go to the small intestine, and that is where it will exist. Again, existation means the cyst will become a trophozoite. And this trophozoite now, as what I have mentioned, 
will be the one to undergo binary fission. This time, the fission usually happens in the large intestine, in the colon. So that is where they multiply. And both the cyst and the trophozoites may be passed in feces or stool, but then you have to take, no take note that only the mature cysts are infective. So that means the mature cyst is the one that can cause disease to humans. So this one shows an illustration of the protozoans found in the stool specimens of humans. So all of them are sarcodina or amoeba. So it's not only enough that we know how it looks like, but we have to dig deeper into its morphology like the number of nucleus, the presence of chromatin, the location of karyosome, and anything that might distinguish this amoeba from another amoeba species because as what you can see, they almost look the same. So you really have to be careful in examining these parasites under the microscope. Let us start with Intamoeba histolytica. So this one again is the only pathogenic member of the sarcodina group and it's the one that is most invasive. So it will not only affect your intestine, but it can also infect your liver, your lungs, or even your brain and other organs. So it's most invasive and it's the only member of the family to cause colitis, inflammation of the colon, and again, it could infect your liver, causing liver abscess. And the disease is what we call as amoebiasis. And the extra-intestinal amoebiasis refers to the infection of amoeba in other organs other than the intestine, like the liver, brain, spleen, and lungs. And also, there are two morphologically indistinguishable species of E. histolytica. So, number one is Intamoeba dysenteriae. So, this one, this is already an old nomenclature. And the other one is Intamoeba dispar. So, that means we cannot distinguish Intamoeba histolytica from these parasites unless we use molecular um, diagnosis such as PCR and other techniques except microscopic techniques because again, they are indistinguishable. Another thing about E. histolytica is that it's also classified as a large race histolytica or small race histolytica. So that is based on its size. So for large race, it's greater than 10 micrometers, whereas for small race, just like your E. heart money, that is less than 10 micrometers. Now let us differentiate E. histolytica from E. coli. So let me just emphasize that I'm talking about Intamoeba coli because there is also a bacterium known as E. coli, but that stands for Escherichia coli. So this one, this is a parasite. So for the trophozoites, the trophozoite of E. histolytica has a finger-like pseudopod. So this one, finger-like pseudopodia. Whereas for E. coli, that's blunt or rounded. Next one, for motility. So, E. histolytica has a progressive and directional motility. So, that's a total opposite of E. coli because E. coli is sluggish and non-directional in movement. For the karyosome, E. histolytica, the karyosome of which is at the center. So, this one. So, the karyosome is at the center. Whereas, for E. coli, it's eccentric. So, it's at the sides. Next one. Take note of this. Endoplasm. So, the endoplasm of E. histolytica contains ingested red blood cells, whereas your E. coli contains bacteria, yeast, and debris. I want you to remember this because I want you to know that this one is the most reliable way of distinguishing E. histolytica from E. coli if we are talking about their trophozoite. So, again, the most reliable way of distinguishing E. coli and E. histolytica trophozoid is the ingested material in their endoplasm. So since E. histolytica contains red blood cells, it is referred to as a clean-looking trophozoid. For E. coli, since it has this ingested materials, it's referred to as a dirty-looking trophozoid. How about for the cyst? So for the cyst, again, this is the dormant stage. The mature cyst is considered as the infective stage. This one is non-motile. So for the number of nuclei, it's 1 to 4. 
for ihistolitika, whereas for e. coli, it's 1 to 8. But take note also of the karyosome, just like in trophozoite, the karyosome of the cyst of e. histolytica is also centrally located. And it is 1 to 4. And the E. coli has 1 to 8 nuclei. And still, the karyosome is eccentric. So as what you can see here in the illustration, that's eccentric. Another thing is the chromatoidal bars or bodies of the cyst of E. histolytica and E. coli. So for E. histolytica, that is rod-shaped or sausage-shaped or cigar-shaped. How about for E. coli? So it's splintered needles which bloom or whisk in shape. So that's for the chromatoidal bars or bodies. So as what I have mentioned, the most reliable way of distinguishing your E. histolytica and E. coli in terms of trophozoite is the ingested material. However, for the cyst, the most reliable way of distinguishing E. histolytica from E. coli are their chromatoidal bars or bodies because again, the E. histolytica is rod-shaped or cigar-shaped or sausage-shaped whereas your E. coli, it's splintered. It's like a witch bloom. And another one, the cyst of E. histolytica, the mature cyst, it's the one that is infective. So that means it's the one that can infect humans. And the mature cyst contains four nuclei. So that's why we call it as quadrinucleated cyst. So quadrinucleated cyst, it has four nuclei. How about the trophozoites? How many nuclei can you see in histolytica and E. coli? So in the trophozoites, they only have one nucleus each. It's only the cyst having multiple nuclei. So under the microscope, this is what you can see. And as what you can observe here, it's already colored because this one is stained with iodine. So this is a cyst of intamoeba histolytica. So take a look at the chromatoidal bar. So I've mentioned that the most distinguishing characteristic of E. histolytica from your E. coli or intamoeba coli is its chromatoidal bar. So this one, it's a chromatoidal body shaped like a sausage or a cigar. And for the nuclei, so we only have two nuclei here. Remember, the range is 1 to 4, so this is not yet matured cyst. So also the karyosome, you can see here, it's at the center. So that's for intamoeba histolytica cyst. This one, this is the trophozoite of intamoeba histolytica. So again, as what I have mentioned, we have to look at the endoplasm because that's the most reliable way of distinguishing your ehistolytica from intamoeba coli. So inside of which, in the endoplasm, what you can see are ingested RBCs. And also, you only have one nucleus and take note of the location of the karyosome. So still, it's centrally located. So that is intamoeba histolytica. And here, you can also see extension here for motility. So that is a pseudopod, the Antonis iodine. So that would color the glycogen of the amoeba as reddish brown, the cytoplasm as yellow, and the chromatin will be brown or black. So this one compares the saline mount preparation and the iodine mount preparation. So for saline mount, what is really distinct here is the chromatoidal bar, which is still sausage or cigar shape. And we can also see nuclei here and the karyosome is still at the center. For this one, it's more distinct because it's already stained with iodine, so we can still see the chromatoidal bar, and what is really distinct here is the location of the karyosome, which is at the center. For the life cycle of intamoeba histolytica, I provided two pictures here to give a clear illustration on its life cycle. 
So in the previous discussion, we have tackled about the different mode of transmission of the different parasites and I hope you still remember the mode of transmission of Intamoeba histolytica. So the life cycle of Intamoeba histolytica begins when a mature cyst, so this one, so that mature cyst is ingested by a human person. But this one is not the only mode of transmission of Intamoeba histolytica. And remember that the mature cyst of Intamoeba histolytica contains four nuclei. That is why it is referred to as the quadrinucleated cyst. So for other mode of transmission, that includes venereal transmission, so this one. So venereal transmission, so that means uh, it is related to sexual intercourse or it's relating to our genital area or other sexually transmitted diseases. Also, there is this direct colonic inoculation through contaminated enema equipment. So through enema equipment. So this one, this enema is a medical procedure which involves the injection of fluid into the lower bowel by way of a rectum. So this is commonly used to treat constipation. So what is done in this procedure is a liquid is introduced into the colon in order to soften or liquefy the stool and this procedure will distend the intestine to increase the peristalsis or the contractions of the intestine that will lead to the excretion of feces or gases. So going back, once the cyst is ingested from fecally contaminated material, what will happen now is existation will occur in the small intestine or large bowel. So that means the cyst will turn into a trophozoite. So after ingestion of this mature cyst, the existation will happen in the small intestine or large bowels. So it's either here or in this area. And what will happen next is that this uh, existation is a type of nuclear division which will be followed by a cytoplasmic division to form eight trophozoites. So now the trophozoites, those trophozoites that were liberated, will colonize the bowel, but you have to remember that the cysts are never found within the invaded tissues. So after existation, what will happen is the trophozoite will then insist. So they will turn into a cyst again, producing this uninucleated cyst with one nucleus, of course. And it then undergoes two successive nuclear division to form a characteristic quadrinucleated cyst, which is the infective stage. So again, what is the mode of transmission? The mode of transmission is through ingestion of fecally contaminated material. Other transmission includes venereal transmission or direct inoculation to our colon using this enema procedure. And the infective stage is the quadrinucleated cyst. How about the diagnostic stage? So when we say diagnostic stage, these are the stages of the parasite which we can see or which we can isolate from their specimen. So in this case, both the trophozoites and the cysts are the diagnostic stages of Intamoeba histolytica. So that's for the life cycle. And I just want you to take note that this cyst, particularly the quadrinucleated cyst, is resistant to gastric acidity and desiccation. And this can survive in a moist environment for several weeks. And also, because of colonic invasion of Intamoeba histolytica, this Intamoeba histolytica can remain dormant in our intestine. And when triggered, we can have a reinfection of Intamoeba histolytica. And aside from intestinal invasion, it is also seen here that the Intamoeba histolytica can invade other organs such as the brain, also the lungs, and the most common is the liver. And this is what we call as the extra intestinal amoebiasis. For the pathogenesis of E. histolytica, we have amoebic dysentery, amoebic colitis, and amoebic liver abscess. So majority of the cases of Intamoeba histolytica present as asymptomatic infections. However, the cyst stage of this parasite is still passed out in the stool sample. 
So this asymptomatic carrier can still infect others even though they don't exhibit the signs and symptoms of the disease. So this asymptomatic infections, we refer it as the cyst carrier stage. So they don't have signs and symptoms but we can recover the cyst stage of intamoeba histolytica in their feces. So for amoebic dysentery, this is an acute disease characterized by bloody diarrhea and abdominal cramping. And take note that this amoebic dysentery may invade the intestinal mucosa. So there will be invasion of that part of the intestine producing ulcers in the intestine that could lead to perforation and eventually peritonitis. And also, there is this what we call as amoebic colitis. So this one mimics ulcerative colitis. So this infection presents as a gradual onset of abdominal pain and also abdominal cramping. And also, since this is an amoebic infection, so we would expect, of course, that there is diarrhea. So it's either bloody or non-bloody diarrhea. And there is this presence of mucus in the stool. So bloody or non-bloody diarrhea. And although some patients may only have intermittent diarrhea and alternating with constipation as well, the children, they could develop what we call as the fulminant colitis. So this one, fulminant colitis. So this case uh, already has severe bloody diarrhea. It includes also fever and also abdominal pain. So that is common in children. So this is a somewhat rare but serious form of ulcerative colitis. And this one causes inflammation and sores in the lining of the colon. So that's common in children. Next one, for amoebic colitis, this is also a characteristic of the disease. So there is a development of a flask-shaped ulcer. That's because of the invasion of the intestinal mucosa and also of the, in, um, the submucosa of the intestine. So that's for amoebic colitis and amoebic dysentery. So this one. So this shows the intestine of an individual. This is a case of intestinal amoebiasis. So if the case is invasive, we can see the mucosa invaded by the parasite. That's why you could see lesions there in the mucosa. And also take note that the shape of the ulcer is like a flask. So just imagine an Erlenmeyer flask. So this is the neck of the ulcer and this one, this is the base of the ulcer. So this is already in the mucosal region and this one, the submucosal region is already invaded. So this one also shows a flask-shaped ulcer. So this is a characteristic of amoebic dysentery. And this is already an invasive type, so it could lead to amoebic colitis and eventually peritonitis and this characteristic shape of ulcer, the flask-shaped ulcer. Now this one shows the process and pathogenesis of invasive amoebiasis. So we have talked about amoebic dysentery and amoebic colitis, so let's see how this process works and causes disease. So first, what will happen is that the trophozoites of intamoeba histolytica will colonize the mucosal surface of the large intestine and after colonization they will start to adhere to the mucous layer of the large intestine and that is also the time where they begin to ingest bacteria and other cellular debris from the lumen of the intestine and the reason why this trophozoite could adhere or could attach to the intestinal mucosal surface is because they have lectins so lectins are carbohydrate binding proteins. So both the cyst and the trophozoites of intamoeba histolytica contain lectins. So for the cyst, the lectins identified are Jacob 2, Jesse 3, and chitinase. Again, these lectins are found in the wall or the cyst wall of intamoeba histolytica. For the trophozoite, their lectins are classified as being inhibited by galactose, so by galactose and galnac. So this one, this is N-acetyl D-galactosamine. So again, for the cyst, we have Jacob 2, Jesse 3, and chitinase, but for trophozoite, 
the lectins are inhibited by galactose and N-acetyl-D-galactosamine. So this process of colonization and attachment by the trophozoite is mediated by these lectins present on the walls of the cyst and the trophozoites of Intamoeba histolytica. And this infection is usually non-invasive and usually it's also asymptomatic. However, some of the cases exhibit symptoms ranging from mild abdominal discomfort to diarrhea and also cramps. But again, most of the time, it's non-invasive and asymptomatic. Next one, a breakdown in the mucus barrier because of this attachment can lead to a contact-dependent killing of the epithelial cells. So this yellow one, so these are your epithelial cells. That means because of the attachment of trophozoites to the mucus layer, the epithelial cells will be destroyed. And the reason why this can happen is because the trophozoites secrete proteases that can weaken the mucus. So again, these trophozoites secrete proteases and those proteases weaken the mucus. And also, there are some cysteine proteinases that can contribute to the disruption of these epithelial cells during invasion of the colon. So there are as well cysteine proteinases that helps in the destruction of epithelial cells. And also, the process of apoptosis will be activated and the necrotic mechanisms can also add up to the destruction of these epithelial cells. And this necrosis as a result of this process will eventually lead to an invasive disease and that is characterized by dysentery. So that means we can see blood and mucus in the feces of the person. And in addition to that, there will be a breakdown of the tissue and this one, the extracellular matrix, also because of the proteases released by the trophozoites. After the disruption of the epithelial cells and the extracellular matrix, the trophozoites will continue to advance laterally and downward into the submucosa. So from here, they will move laterally towards the submucosa. So it has already invaded the submucosa layer. And that is also the time that it will produce a flask-shaped ulcer. And there will be a necrotic material found at the center of the ulcer. So most of the necrotic material will be found here while most of the amoeba are at the borders. So we can find amoeba here between the healthy cells and the damaged tissues. And in this stage, the neutrophils and other immune effector cells are also killed by the amoeba. And the amoeba are now ingesting the host cells instead of the bacteria that they have initially ingested while attaching to the mucosa layer of the intestine. And that is the reason why the trophozoites of E. histolytica contain ingested RBC. And we call these trophozoites that ingest RBC as hematophagous trophozoites. So let me write that one. So hematophagous trophozoites. And also, um, the ulcers can coalesce or let's say they can form a larger necrotic ulcer and that will lead now to the shedding of patches of mucosa and that's how the flask-shaped ulcer is formed because of the invasion of Intamoeba histolytica. Now, aside from the ulceration of the mucosa layer and submucosa layer, the trophozoites can also penetrate the muscles and the serous layer. And this one can lead to intestinal perforation. So this layer here can be perforated. And this perforation of the intestinal wall can lead to peritonitis or the leakage into the abdominal cavity. And also, there will be an erosion of the blood vessels. So that could lead to hemorrhage or let's say massive hemorrhage. However, this perforation and peritonitis and also the hemorrhage occur rarely. And another one, there will be an inflammatory thickening of the intestinal wall. So that thickening of the intestinal wall is what we call as amoeboma. So amoeboma or amoebic granuloma. And this amoeboma presents as a painful palpable mass that can be mistaken for a tumor during examination. So from that area, from, the, from here, the trophozoites can now gain access to the circulatory system. So that is what we call as hematogenous spread. So hematogenous spread. So from the blood, it will disseminate to the tissues and to the other organs of the body. 
So once it reaches the tissues and other organs, that is now what we call as extra-intestinal amebiasis. And speaking of that, the liver is the primary site of extra-intestinal amebiasis. And the hematogenous spread to other organs also occur, but it is so rare. And also, there will be a metastasis to the liver, so it can occur, and it can, um, it can involve the portal vein, which of course carries the blood from the colon into the liver. So that's how the invasive amebiasis happens. So this picture also shows the invasion of large intestine or colon by intermeba histolytica, just like what I have discussed in the previous picture. So upon entry in the intestinal lumen, this one, these trophozoites, as what we can see here, they will invade the intestinal mucosa and then they will penetrate the submucosa and eventually it will lead to the development of a flask-shaped ulcer. And again, this is a type of spreading ulcer and these ulcers are described to have irregular margins. So the margins here are irregular and the base or the floor of this ulcer is described to be necrotic. And also, as what I have mentioned earlier, there will be amoeba that can be found inside of this ulcer. So again, in the lateral part because of the manner of how they move from the mucosa down to the submucosa. And also, this ulcer may slough off and that could lead to a widespread ulceration and deep extension that can result to peritonitis and perforation of the intestine and also hemorrhage. But again, it's very rare. And as well, there will be secondary infections and inflammatory reactions and fibroblastic proliferations. And aside from that, this amoeba can also spread to the circulatory system or it can go to the blood. So that is what we call as hematogenous spread. And eventually, they will reach or they will invade the other organs of the body just like the liver, the brain, and the lungs. So this one shows the image of the tissues and organs invaded by Intamoeba histolytica. So what we can see here are infiltrated tissues, and these infiltrated tissues are described to have a red-brown fluid, or sometimes it is referred to as chocolate-colored fluid. And also they contain cellular debris. I know you already understand why it happens because of the pathogenesis again of invasive amoebiasis. And aside from that, other infections can occur just like balanitis and vulvitis. So this balanitis is the inflammation of the glands or the head of the penis. And also the trophozoites may be seen in liver biopsy specimen in cases of hepatic amoebiasis. And again, as what I have said, the hematogenous spread rarely happens in other organs such as the lungs and the brain. And also this one, this image shows the different tissues and organs of the body affected by intamoeba histolytica. So as mentioned, the most common form of extraintestinal amoebiasis is the liver. So it could develop a disease, what we call as the amoebic liver abscess. And this occurs to 5% of the patients with a history of intestinal amoebiasis. And for the cardinal manifestation of this amoebic liver abscess, we have the fever and the right upper quadrant pain. So usually the pain is localized or referred to the right shoulder. And also the liver is tender, especially in acute cases. And there is also enlargement of liver or what we call as hepatomegaly. Usually, it is present in 50% of the cases. So this one shows the amoebic liver abscess. And in the laboratory, the detection of antibodies in the serum is still the key in the diagnosis of amoebic liver abscess. And the antibodies have been demonstrated also in the asymptomatic intestinal infections. So serology is really helpful in monitoring of the cyst carrier. And also, um, this... Detection of antibodies is usually done because microscopic detection cannot be done because the aspiration of the lesions is an invasive procedure. And the trophozoites are often missed because of how they are located in the abscess. Again, most of the time they are located in the periphery of the abscess. That's why they are not commonly isolated or aspirated. 
So detection of antibody is done instead of this microscopic detection of the stages of the parasite, particularly the trophozoite. So in order to simplify everything that I have discussed, I created here a drawing showing the life cycle and the pathogenesis of Intamoeba histolytica. So let us start first with the mode of transmission. So the mode of transmission of Intamoeba histolytica is through ingestion. Ingestion of what? Ingestion of fecally contaminated food or particularly water. So how about the infective stage? So the infective stage is a quadri nucleated cyst. So this is how it looks like. So it's a mature cyst containing four nuclei. And this infective stage, once it enters the body, it will pass through the stomach down to the small intestine. And in the lumen of the small intestine, it will begin to exist. So meaning to say it will undergo existation. Again, when we say existation, meaning to say the cyst will turn into a trophozoite. So these trophozoites will then multiply through binary fission. And these trophozoites will colonize and will attach to the mucosal surface. So there will be colonization and colonic invasion. So invasion of the mucosa and submucosa leading to this flask-shaped ulcer. So this one. So this flask-shaped ulcer again, the margin is irregular and the base is described as necrotic. And also, these trophozoites can then insist, so meaning to say they can develop into a cyst. So both the trophozoites and the cyst are found in the feces. That's why they are considered as the diagnostic stages. When we say diagnostic stages, these are again the stage of the parasite that can be isolated or can be detected in the specimen. So in this case, in the fecal sample. And for the pathogenesis, we have colonic invasion, colonization, and also development of this flask-shaped ulcer. There is also invasion of mucosa and submucosa. There is neutrophil-induced damage, amoebic colitis, amoebic cytotoxicity, hematogenous spread, and also extra-intestinal amoebiasis. And the most common, again, is the liver. So let us differentiate bacillary dysentery from amoebic dysentery. So they are two different diseases. One is parasitic, so amoebic dysentery is caused by a parasite in Tamiba histolytica, whereas bacillary dysentery is usually associated with a species of bacteria from the family Enterobacteriaceae, particularly the bacterium we call as Shigella. But other bacteria such as Salmonella, Campylobacter, Yersinia, and other enteroinvasive E. coli can also cause bacillary dysentery. So in this case, this may be epidemic and it has an acute onset. However, for the amoebic dysentery, it is seldom epidemic and it has a gradual onset. And also, prodromal fever and malay are common in bacillary dysentery and we cannot see that in amoebic dysentery. So when we say prodromal, that means there is an early symptom indicating the onset of a disease or an illness. And also in this case, vomiting is common. And we cannot find that in amoebic dysentery. And next one, in bacillary dysentery, usually the patient prostrates. So that means the patient is lying down on his or her bed because of this one, fever and malay. However, in amoebic dysentery, the patient is usually ambulant. So meaning to say the patient is able to walk, able to do his or her daily activities. And for the diarrhea, the characteristic diarrhea of bacillary dysentery is watery and bloody. And for amoebic dysentery, it's a bloody diarrhea. This one is having an odorless stool. This one has a fishy odor stool. How about what we can see under the microscope. So for bacillary dysentery, we can see numerous bacilli. Remember, this is a bacterial infection. And this Shigella is also a bacillus. And also, in amoebic dysentery, there is just few bacilli because this is parasitic. There's pus cells in bacillary dysentery owing to the fact that this is a bacterial infection. Also, there are red cells and macrophages and also take note of this one, 
there is no charcot-laden crystals present in basiliary dysentery, but it is found in amebic dysentery. Aside from the trophozoids, of course, with ingested RBCs, that is diagnostic for intamoeba histolytica. So this is the one that would tell us that what we are dealing with is a parasitic condition caused by intamoeba histolytica. And also, in basiliary dysentery, abdominal cramps are common and severe. However, in amoebic dysentery, there is just mild abdominal cramps. Next one, tenesmus is common in basiliary dysentery, but it's uncommon in amoebic dysentery. So when we say tenesmus, this one is a distressing or ineffectual urge to evacuate the rectum or bladder. So it gives you the feeling that you need to have a bowel movement even if you've already had one. And when you have tenesmus, you might strain harder to produce only a, sm a small amount of stool during bowel movement. So it's common in basiliary dysentery. And also the natural history of this, there is spontaneous recovery in few days, few weeks or more. So there is no relapse. However, this one it could last for weeks and dysentery returns after remission and the infection persists for years. Remember, I have told you that the amoeba or the intamoeba histolytica can remain dormant in the ulcerations in the intestine. And when triggered, they could again reinfect the person who has been formerly infected with amoebic dysentery. So those are the differentiating points between basiliary dysentery and amoebic dysentery. So this one shows the image of charcot laden crystals. Again, these are found in amoebic dysentery. So these crystals are hexagonal and bipyramidal in structure and they are localized in the primary granules of eosinophils and also of the basophils. Take note of this one because the presence of eosinophils is already a clue that the infection is parasitic in nature. That's why we can commonly observe this in amoebic dysentery. However, these charcot laden crystals are not only observed in amoebic dysentery because these are also present in allergic reactions like asthma or bronchitis or even allergic rhinitis. So we can see this from the specimens of patients suffering from those kind of diseases. And also, these charcot laden crystals are composed of binding proteins. So the binding proteins are called as the galactin 10. So this is an eosinophilic lysophospholipase binding protein found again in charcot laden crystals. This one also shows the charcot laden crystals in saline preparation of stool and also of sputum. Also this one. So this picture shows the unstained and stained images of charcot laden crystals. For the microscopic diagnosis of intamoeba histolytica, a minimum of three stool specimens must be collected by the patient in different days. And also, the medical technologist must examine or must process the fresh stool sample within 30 minutes, particularly those that are watery or diarrheic. So that's for trophozoic identification. And also, for direct fecal smear, we can use saline to observe trophozoites motility. So, take note that the motility of intamoeba histolytica is progressive and directional. And also this one, methylene blue. So, this can be used to differentiate intamoeba from WBC because it's the intamoeba that will take up the color of the methylene blue. So, this one will stain blue. And also the iodine. So, this can be used to observe the nucleus and the karyosome and also the glycogen. However, you have to remember again and again that this one must be used only to observe for the cyst stage because this iodine will destroy the trophozoids of the intamoeba. And also, one of the diagnostic features of intamoeba histolytica trophozoid is the ingested RBC present in its endoplasm. So one of the most commonly used concentration techniques in the laboratory is the formalin ether concentration technique. And these are the different layers formed after the final centrifugation. So starting from the bottom, we have the sediments containing the parasites. 
On the second layer from the bottom, we have the formaldehyde or formal water. Third layer from the bottom, we have the fecal debris. And lastly, on the uppermost part, we have the ether. So in order for me to easily remember these different layers, I just imagine the setup of heaven and hell. So of course, in the most bottom part of the earth, there is hell. And that is where you can find Satan. And that letter S there corresponds to the sediments. And also, these parasites, they are bad creatures, so they're located in hell. So anyway, I know that's corny, so let's proceed with the second layer from the bottom. So we have the formaldehyde or the formal water. So just imagine that other people believe that before we reach heaven, there is this waiting area. So the waiting area is the purgatory. So I'm not mistaken with the spelling. It's just for you to easily remember that one. And on the third layer, starting from the bottom, we have this letter D. So can you guess what is it? So they said that before we enter heaven, we have to pass through the heaven's gate or the door of the heaven. And lastly, on top, of course, we have the heaven. And in heaven, there is letter E. So can you guess what is this letter E? So in heaven, there is eternal happiness. So that stands for ether. So I hope this will work for you because somehow this has worked for me as well. We can also use tool culture for the isolation of intamoeba species. And we have this Robinson's and Inoki medium. So this is more sensitive than the usual stool microscopy, but this one is not routinely available. And also take note of this reporting format. So I have mentioned in the previous discussion that the differentiation of intamoeba histolytica and intamoeba dispar is not possible by microscopy. So this can only be done through PCR, through ELISA, or isoenzyme analysis. So those laboratories that do not use one of the immunologic or molecular methods to differentiate e histolytica from e dispar or those laboratories that rely exclusively on morphologic analysis must use this reporting format, so e histolytica slash dispar. So for the treatment and prognosis of the pathogenic amoeba, which is the intamoeba histolytica, there are two objectives. So number one, it's to cure invasive disease at both intestinal and extra-intestinal sites. And number two, to eliminate the passage of cyst from the intestinal lumen. This is just to prevent infecting other people. So for the drug of choice, we have metronidazole as the drug of choice for invasive amoebiasis. And also, the nitroimidazole derivative such as the tinidazole or cyclidazole can also be used. And also, the drug of choice for asymptomatic cyst passers. So we have the diloxanide furoate. And this diloxanide furoate is also given after a course of metronidazole for invasive amoebiasis.